When people talk about growing their cities, the discussion usually revolves around how much. But when it comes to small towns in Saskatchewan, it's most common that the discussion revolves around whether it will just hang on or whether it will waste away. But that's not the case in Olgama, a community of about 300 people an hour south of Regina. In fact, the topic of conversation in that town and throughout the region most often centers on which project will be next. Olgama has been winning actually for several years now and the community has no intention of stopping. As Mayor Wayne Myron points out, there are some key lessons for other communities. Often the origin of success is necessity. That often means the community has its back against the wall. But as he points out just as emphatically, any community can. Myron talks about what can only be classed as an amazing sequence of events. Events that have lifted this town out of the doldrums and onto the fast track of development. Well, I guess in some necessity-driven actions back in late 70s, early 80s, there was a lot of things that happened that we had to do something to make a change. So we, uh, we looked at various things. We started out with our, tra or with our economic development committee that was formed as a very informal group, but we started off trying a trade show. Uh, and that sounds pretty small and maybe unique to a small town Saskatchewan, but it turned out to be, I mean, we challenge the cities now with our trade show. We get 105 booths at it. Uh, uh, we get lots of people coming from the area, but what it does is it proved to our community that you can do things in small town. The first project we actually took over, again necessity driven because of some of the cutbacks and whatever was the hospital situation, and we didn't fight because we knew the hospital in a neighboring community was going to go down. But we looked at alternatives, we found alternatives to create it into a, uh, the first in Saskatchewan personal care nonprofit home, community owned, uh, attached to a health center which is the first in Saskatchewan. And that really opened the door with communities working together and opened that enthusiasm with regional concept. Uh, with that under our belt, then we started looking at uh, a project with the hog uh, intensive livestock operation. And our community was very open to that. Um, contrary to some belief around the province, our community looked at it as a positive, not a negative. Uh, we, we approached it with the view that Yes, hogs smell, but let's do what we can do to, to fix that to make it work because the positives way outweigh the negatives. Probably one of the biggest turning points uh, because it did create 50 new jobs. With that in our belt, uh, different things were going on all at the same time. Um, CPR Rail was closing down the branch line. A group of interested farmers said, no, another nail in our coffin. Let's grab that puppy and, and make it work. And they did. They fought adversity. They did what they had to do and uh, bought the rail line, 117 kilometers. And since then, that rail line, without knowing, has been a catalyst for a lot of projects. Um, one being our rail line project with our museum. We've now got the original railway station back there. It's tied into our museum grounds. Uh, we're looking to do a tour train down the road. Uh, it'll be the only rural setting of its kind in Canada. Um, since that, uh, we've worked on a motel because we didn't have a place for the crews to stay, so the community got together and we found a unique way to put a motel unit in town. Again, uh, shareholder owned, but a very unique uh, experience. And since that, now another fabrication shop has started uh, manufacturing products, pressure vessels, and uh, is working with a company, major oil company in Calgary, Alberta. So we can do it in Ogama. A key step in this process, as Myron points out, is to assemble the team. Easier said than done, you might say. But the principle is simple. More people are better. One of the things that Olgama did well is to avoid a common problem in small communities, volunteer burnout. It did that by making sure the team involved many people in their town. In other words, Olgama developed a team of leaders. We had a group of individuals get together for the Fair Share Saskatchewan proposal, and as everybody knows, that wasn't successful, but what it did do is bring a very interested group of individuals, and I might add, it was it's everybody. It's young, old, I mean, farmers, business people, very informal, anybody can come to our meeting at any time. But since that time, probably every member on that economic development group has chaired or been part of a major project in the community. Um, we've expanded to other, them people also sit on other boards within the community, our rink board, our curling club, our museum board, uh, our town council, our RM council. Uh, they've been very involved. Uh, so it, what it does is it puts it puts information out onto all them boards and it, and it creates more people working within the community, more interest. Number one, got to be positive. Have to be positive. Uh, you got to try and bring in other people. Like I say, people on our economic development committee and our councils, 
are all leaders. There was one point where our community wanted to get rid of all the communities and put in one. And some in the community fought that and said no. Six people might be interested in curling, some might be interested in hockey. And I think by us saving all them different boards might have had something to do with it because there is chairman each one of those boards. There is a leader already. The trick was to just coordinate them and that, and that seems to have happened. Projects such as those Myron describes don't just happen on their own, of course. These projects may be conjured up in people's minds, but they have to be fueled by investment. It's important, particularly in small communities, to find the right, and that often means new, methods by which residents can invest in the future of their own town. We identified in our strategic plan back in 2001, I believe we did our plan, and we identified that as one thing that the community was desperately in need of. Uh, because when we, and it was proven when the hog barns were built, the intensive livestock operation, we didn't have the facilities to keep people here. Uh, they were going everywhere else to stay, and so if we were going to go to all that work to bring people here, we had to have a place for them to stay. Uh, we worked with the local credit union to come up with a unique self-directed RSP plan, and we had to limit the amount of shares we sold on the motel. Uh, people just flogged on it, bought it, it's uh, shareholder driven, it was bought and paid for the day uh, it opened. Well, one thing, it is a struggle in small town at times to start a new business off the ground, and what we did is uh, expanded that responsibility. Uh, we've got more people involved. Uh, when you have 40 people, shareholders involved, they pay attention to what the community is doing to draw people to make sure that thing's full. So it, it has some uniqueness that it drives everybody in the community to make it work, and, and it was successful. But how do you keep people involved and enthused? The name of the game, says Myron, is to take the time as a community to celebrate every time you win. Well, you've got to remember that it has to be a group in a small community. It has to be a big number of people within the community development because one or two people can't do it. Uh, we tried to invite everybody we could get everybody involved in our strategic planning process. One thing that we did do that was very successful, we had a community supper, we invited a guest speaker, and then we presented our plan to the community. Where we were, had been, where we were, where we see ourselves going. That was huge. Uh, we had about 200 people at that meeting, but lots of influential people within the community, and it really set the tone. So everybody knew it stopped the naysayers because people knew where we were going, why we were doing it, and what our focus was. And it's, and it's fallen into place ever since then. We do press releases. Uh, we try and let people know in the newspapers, in the radio, in the television, every kind of format we can, we try to pump our successes because that's, when you're small, that's all you've got to do is make sure people understand that small, a small group of people can make a huge difference. So you have to, you have to get it out there. You have to advertise your successes and let people know what's going on. But every community, from the smallest hamlet to the largest city, has its share of naysayers. It's a problem everywhere. So the question is, what do you do about these people who seem to thrive on finding a hundred reasons that nothing will work? Well, as Myron points out, the only solution is to outnumber them, and then wear them down until they just don't matter anymore. You have to market your community. You have to communicate your plan. You have to communicate your successes. And you know what happens when that, when that goes on is pretty soon the naysayers become very low-key. And the ones that are there, people don't listen to anymore. Lots of people want to hear positives in the community now. They like to hear what's happening, where we're headed, how's that project making out. That's the fun part about it. That makes it a fun place to live. Given today's labor shortage, economic development success is often driven by access to a labor pool. In essence, the community that has access to qualified labor wins, no matter how large or how small that town or city might be. As Myron notes, the competition for labor is so intense that one approach will not be enough. The issue has to be addressed on several fronts, and it likely means working alongside businesses in the area. My personal opinion, it's a challenge, and I, don't, I think it's a challenge no matter where you live. Um, Alberta is running out of people. Um, we have been fortunate, we've been able to attract people to work. Uh, some people have come home to work. They see the benefits of living here, uh, they're proud of their community. But I think this province, this country, has is, is got a huge problem and we have got to approach immigration immensely to make it work. We've already opened a file with Big Sky Farms and when we do our next uh, intensive livestock project, even though we don't plan on doing immigration strictly just for that, 
we're going to use that as a stepping stone and we've uh, opened a file with them, we've agreed how we're going to approach it and when they announce the next set of barns starting we're going to initiate that process. Saying we're using Big Sky as a catalyst uh, because they have some experience at that, they have the people in place, we've already discussed a lot of the issues, we met with delegations from Germany, Denmark, Mexico, the Philippines, but we want to make it Right. We, the, we want to make sure we do it small, but we do it right out of the gate so we understand the process really well. The community buys into it. Then we want to invite all businesses to get involved and, and we want to help them do that. Like anything else in life, there will be setbacks. Communities are not immune. But that doesn't mean they can sit back, wilt, or give up. This is the place where that sheer will to win has to come into play. This is where a town has to decide, not if it is a have or have not, but whether it is a will or a will not community. But a town that has started to achieve, to grow, and to execute its game plan is much better prepared to stare down those pressures. I don't want to pinpoint any political party, but the system, the politics, big corporations, the mindset for the last 10 years or so has been big is better. And People have taken that initiative. I don't know whether it's trained into them, but engineers, consultants, uh, the CEOs of corporations, they all think big is better. And to some degree, they're right. There is some efficiencies running big is better. But that has really been detrimental to small town Saskatchewan because there's so many offer opportunities, so many efficiencies that can be had that they've lost sight of that. And that's been one of our biggest struggles is the will and desire to actually keep rural Saskatchewan alive. And um, we, we have just said we're not going to sit down and die. We're going to show people that there is can be a difference made. We're going to show people that you can invest in small towns of Saskatchewan. We're going to show people you can grow your population, you can keep your school, you can do different things. And I think we're making a difference. Our community is determined. We're going to make this thing work. We're going to keep this community growing. We are going to be an example of how if we have to do it on ourselves, I guess we'll do it ourselves. It's not about money. It's about putting places, things in places that make a difference. It's about a rural way of life. And we can protect that and we're, we're, we're going to do that. That's our goal. As Wayne Myron noted, Olgama started small with a trade show. But with a plan in hand and with some small successes in place, it got on a roll. Once the process starts, advises Myron, there's no point in stopping partway through. His advice? Go for the whole bundle. We took on uh, an ILO intensive livestock operation, $33 million to construct, 50 employees. That's a huge project for a town at, at the last census was 292. Bought a rail line for a million and a half dollars, built a health care center for a million and a half dollars, bought the elevator for 200,000, bought a motel for 200,000, moved a railway station for 100,000. Is there, is, there, is there a limit? No, there is no limit. The success story that is Olga Moss, Saskatchewan is a combination of a game plan, community involvement, the right investment tools, and perhaps above all else, a will to win that has been reinforced by celebrating its success. I think the biggest thing is you have to, you have, to have all your communities, all your community committees involved from the school to the rink to the museums to all the committees got to be involved. You've got to communicate where you're going, what you're doing and how you're going to get there. And you've got to communicate what difference that is going to have and the impact it's going to have your community. You've got to make sure that your kids are involved. You've got to make your kids proud of your community. Ours is. They're very, very proud of their community. And if you do that, pretty soon it starts working. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. There's no magic pill. It, it takes a period of years, but you'll see the change, and, and we're seeing it here. I have been around doing presentations, and I see lots of communities that are really trying to make a difference. Got to be careful. Uh, there's some pitfalls in that is just by hiring one economic development officer, not saying that you don't need one, but you got to be careful because one person can't do it all. I'm sorry. The whole community's got to buy in it. They all got to participate in it. Strategic planning is very important, but the same thing. If the whole community doesn't buy into it, if you don't really visit it, you don't have a group that's fondling that, handling it, molding it, it's a waste of money. It's very important to do it, but you've got to look after it yourself as a group and you've got to have people in the community interested. Communication, big, big part. 
As Wayne Myron points out, there's nothing magic about the process. It isn't easy, but it is doable. The point is, any community can.